All right, back by popular demand. I got a uh, review session for the September 2018 exam. Uh, what I'm going to do for this cycle is I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, do a couple of these. I'll, I'll make them shorter instead of a really big long one. So this is just something me and uh, some of my second classes at work, what we've been doing in our after hour study group. This one that we're doing today will be focused mostly on preventative medicine. So let's start with those SSIC codes. So if we remember 6,000, right, that's the, that's where you're going to find most of your bib coming from, right, medicine and dentistry. And we remember that six, if we stay in the 6,000, we're talking general or admin when it comes in, when it comes to the medical field. Uh, 61, right, our 6100 series, that's going to be physical fitness. That's where you're going to find uh, your PHA, your deployment health assessment, your PRT. 62, that's the big one, and that's what, mostly what the instructions we were, we'll be talking about today come from, right? That's our preventative medicine. Anything with the 6200 has to do with preventative medicine. 63, general medicine, like your primary care instruction. 64, that's your special fields. Then uh, that's 64 through 65, and our 66 is dentistry. And then from 67 on, that's our equipment and supplies. So let's get it started with tuberculosis. Uh, first question, what instruction is your tuberculosis instruction? What instruction is your tuberculosis instruction? And tuberculosis is 6224.8 Bravo. 6224.8 Bravo. Uh, what form would be used with a PHA to assess the risk of tuberculosis exposure? What forms used in conjunction with that PHA to assess the risk of TB exposure? Well, every year you're going to fill out a NAVMED 6224 slant 8, that interim tuberculosis exposure risk assessment. 6224 slant 8. What form would be used to assess a patient that had five milli a five millimeter in duration on PPD, right? So they got the PPD shot in their forearm. They've got five millimeters in duration. We've got to fill out a NAVMED 6224 slant seven. Slant seven, that's your initial tuberculosis exposure risk assessment. Uh, what form would be used for a patient that's being treated for latent tuberculosis infection? All right, so they got that PPD when it, they had in duration. We said it's positive. Now they're coming in. They're getting treated monthly for latent tuberculosis. Every month we're going to do a 6224 slant 9, right? 64, uh, 6224 slant 9, your monthly evaluation for patients receiving treatment for latent tuberculosis infection. What medication is used for treatment of latent tuberculosis infection? What's our medication for latent tuberculosis? We're going to use isoniazid, right? INH, INH. Uh, what, uh, what is the dose of isoniazid? What is our dosage of isoniazid? We're going to do 5 milligrams per kilograms or a 300 milligram max. And we usually just do the 300 milligrams. Um, so isoniazid, 5 milligrams per kilogram, 300 milligram max. Um, how long are patients on isoniazid when being treated for latent tuberculosis? How long are they going to be on INH for? They're going to be on it for nine months. Uh, patients often miss doses of INH. They can resume treatment as long as they can achieve blank doses and blank months. How many doses do you got to get done within how many months? You've got to get 270 doses done in 12 months. 270 doses in 12 months of INH. Um, what's another method of testing for tuberculosis other than the PPD? What's another method of testing besides PPD? That's your quantiferin TB gold, your QFT TAC G. Um, but uh, we use this instead, not in addition to, right? We can do blood testing. Um, in cases of active tuberculosis and operational commands, who is responsible for contacting the Cognizant Navy Environmental Preventative Medicine Unit? So if we got an active case, who's got to reach out to the Navy Environmental Preventative Medicine Unit or whose responsibility is to make sure it's done? That is the commanding officer or the officer in charge. Um, if a patient is determined to have active TB, what type of mask should they be put in until they are admitted to an isolation room at the MTF? Right. So if you're in an operational setting, you suspect somebody's got uh, active tuberculosis, we got to get them to the hospital and they got to get in isolation. But what are we going to do in the meantime? We're going to put them in a surgical mask. Okay. We're going to put them in a surgical mask. We are going to wear an N95 mask. All right. But the patient gets a surgical mask. Um, what type of mask should medical personnel wear? Well, I gave that one away, right? N95, N95 particulate respirator. Um, and then active TB cases need to have a MER done within how much time? If we got an active TB case, a medical event report has to be done within what time frame? We've got to get that done within 24 hours. That's an urgent medical event report that's got to be done. 
All right, what are the three temperature readings needed to obtain accurate and reliable data on heat stress conditions? What are the three temperature readings needed to obtain accurate and reliable data on heat stress conditions? We need to get dry bulb, we need to get wet bulb, and then we need to get the global temperature. Uh, what does the acronym FEL stand for? What does FEL stand for? FEL stands for physiological heat exposure limits. Physiological heat exposure limits. How many WBGT meters must be on board a ship that is without an automated heat stress system? How many meters, how many WBGT meters do we need on a ship that doesn't have an automated heat stress system? We need two, two meters on there. Uh, how many WBGT meters do we need on a ship that has an automated heat stress system? Uh, if we've got the automated heat stress system, we only need one. Um, at least how many feet must dry bulb thermometers be hung from ventilation openings? How many feet must dry bulb thermometers be hung from ventilation openings? They got to be at least two feet away. Uh, at what temperature do dry bulb temperatures need to be monitored every hour? At what temperature do we need to get dry bulb th uh, temperature recordings every hour? We got to do that if we get above 85 degrees. Above 85 degrees, we're getting the dry bulb temperature every hour. How long must the WBGT meter be in a workspace prior to conducting the first measurement? All right, how long has it got to be in the workspace before we get the first measurement? Five minutes. Five minutes we got to be in the workspace. Um, after the first reading with your WBGT meter, if it's moved but it's still in the same workspace, how long must the surveyor wait before conducting another measurement? How long are we going to wait on that second measurement? We're going to wait three minutes. Three minutes for that second measurement. How many fell curves are there? How many fell curves are there? There are six. There are six. Um, before I get into shipboard pests, uh, where do you find information on um, heat stress, right? What all those questions? What what chapter or what uh, what instructions do those come from? Those came from OPNAV 5119. OPNAV 5119. All right, shipboard pest. Uh, what's the most common encountered shipboard pest? The most common encountered shipboard pest? That's your German cockroach. Uh, how often? How often should pest control specialists conduct cockroach surveys in food service areas? How often should pest control specialists conduct a cockroach survey in food service areas? They got to do that every two weeks, every two weeks. Uh, what if there is a current infestation? If there's a current infestation, it's got to be done weekly. Uh, the presence of how many cockroaches per trap in a 24-hour period indicates that pesticide treatment might be necessary. How many cockroaches per trap in a 24-hour period? Uh, two, two or more. Let's see, what are the four key factors that support cockroach infestation? The uh, key factors that support cockroach infestation are going to be food, water, warmth, and harborage. Um, which stored product pest is internationally quarantined? Which of the stored product pests is internationally quarantined? That's your kaffir beetle. Uh, what are the medically important star stored product pests? What are your medically important stored product pests? Your medically important stored product pests are going to include your domestic beetles and your flower beetles, right? So your domestic beetles, that's going to include, right, uh, your trogoderma, and that's going to include the kaffir beetle. Um, how many of these can we tolerate? in our product how many can we of these can we tolerate in our product none right if we just find one of these guys living or dead uh, adult or larva that's going to get rid of the whole lot flower beetles what are your two flower beetles your two flower beetles that's going to be your red flower beetle and confused flower beetles collectively we can call these guys what what type of beetles are these we call them the tribolium beetles right these are tribolium beetles um what's uh why are these guys medically important they turn our flower gray right and they secrete benzoquinones right they and that's uh it's carcinogenic it has a toxic effect on the food um how many of these guys will we tolerate in our stored products um when we get to three, when we get to three of these guys, right, three per pound, the lot's no good. The food's no good when we get to three. And then what is our tolerance for all the other stored product pests? Seven or more, then that's no good, right? Everything else, seven or more, then we get rid of it. Um, what's the most common stored product pest? The most common stored product pest, that's our sawtooth grain beetle. What stored product pest is considered to be the most destructive? Which of the stored product pests is the most destructive? That's going to be your rice weevil. What is the number one pest of dried fruits in storage? The number one pest of dried fruits in storage, that's your Indian meal moth. 
Within how many hours should onboard inspections of replenishments be conducted? Within how many hours should onboard inspections of replenishments be conducted? We got to do that within 48 hours. Uh, how often should medical department personnel inspect storerooms? How often should medical department personnel inspect storerooms? They should do that at least monthly. Uh, what form is used to report and identify store product pest? What form is used to report and identify stored product pest? That's going to be your DD-1222, the request for and results of test, DD-1222. Uh, where is the DD-1222 going to be sent? We're going to send that, that DD-1222 either to a Navy Environmental Preventative Medicine Unit or the Navy Entomology Center of Excellence. How many specimens do we need to send? How many specimens do we need to send? we got to send two of them. Right. With the exception of moths, how should specimens be preserved? We're going to send those specimens in either 70% uh, ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol if we don't have ethyl alcohol. Um, how do we preserve moths? Well, moths, we're not going to put them in alcohol. We're going to keep them dry and we're going to store them in vials with no cotton. We want to make sure not to put any cotton in the vials with the moths. Um, which of the two rats in the manual is more common on ships? Which of the two rats on the, in this manual is more common on ships? That's going to be your roof rat. Your roof rat is more common aboard Navy ships. Um, what should the minimum diameter of a rat guard be? What should the minimum diameter of a rat guard be? That should be 36 inches, 36 inches for a rat guard. What should the cone angle be? The cone angle of a rat guard needs to be at least 30 degrees. How far should they be from the pier? How far should your rat guard be from the pier? It's got to be six feet. How far should they be from the ship? Your rat guard should be at least two feet away from the ship, right? Six feet from the pier, two feet from the ship, 36 inch diameter with a 30 degree angle on the cone. What instruction is the management of regulated waste? What instruction is the management of regulated waste? That's going to be your BUMED instruction 6280.1 Charlie, 6280.1 Charlie. How many groups of regulated medical waste are there? How many groups of regulated medical waste are there? Well, there are nine. All right, let's go through the nine groups. All right, nine groups of regulated medical waste. We're going to say that group one consists of your culture, stocks, and vaccines. Group one, culture, stocks, and vaccines. Group two, group two is your pathological waste. Group three, blood and blood products. Group three, blood and blood products. Group four, that's going to be your used sharps. Five is going to be animal waste. Six, isolation waste. And then seven, your unused sharps. And then group eight is going to be other. And nine going to be chemotherapy waste. Those are our nine groups of regulated medical waste. One, cultures and stocks. Two, pathological waste. Three, blood and blood products. Four, used sharps. Five, animal waste. Six, Isolation waste, seven use sharps, eight other, nine chemotherapy. How many biosafety levels are there? How many biosafety levels are there? There are four. Uh, what is the most stringent biosafety level? What is the most stringent of the biosafety levels? Well, that's level four. How must pathological waste be stored? How must pathological waste be stored? We're either going to put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. When is pathological waste required to be frozen? We're going to freeze it if it's going to remain on site for longer than 24 hours. Uh, for how long can non-pathological regulated medical waste be placed in storage? For how long can non-pathological regulated medical waste be placed in storage? We can only do that for seven days, up to seven days. All right, moving on to hearing conservation. What noise levels are considered hazardous? What noise levels are considered hazardous? Well, when we get greater than 84 decibels time weighted or peak levels of 140 decibels and above. 84 decibels time weighted or peak levels 140 above. What is utilized to label noise hazardous areas and equipment? What is utilized to label noise hazardous area and equipment? We're going to use a NAVMED 6260 slant 2 or the NAVMED 6260 slant 2 alpha. The 6260 slant 2, that's going to be put on the doors going into a noise, noise hazardous area. And your 6260 slant 2A, that's the sticker, the 2x2 two two sticker that's going to be put on any equipment. What form is your reference audiogram? What form is your reference audiogram? Your reference audiogram is DD2215. DD2215. What system are annual hearing tests entered into? What system are annual hearing tests entered into? They're going to be entered into Doers HC. Doers HC. 
Um, when is a WES, a web enabled safety system entry required? Well, we got to put a WES entry in whenever we have a significant threshold shift in STS averaging 10 or more decibels in the frequencies 2000 through 4000 or a total hearing level that is 25 decibels or more in the same ear. What is considered a significant threshold shift? What is considered a, a significant threshold shift? All right, we got two definitions of an STS, right? A change of 15 decibels or higher at any testing frequency from 1,000 to 4,000 hertz, okay? So just flat out 15, right? A change of 15 decibels or higher and one to 4,000 hertz or a change in hearing averaging 10 decibels or more at 2,000, 3,000 and 4,000 hertz. If a service member has a significant threshold shift on their annual audiogram, at a minimum, how long should they be excluded from noise hazards before retesting? How long do they need noise rest for? They need noise rest for 14 hours, 14 hours of noise rest. How often do audiometric chambers need to be recalibrated? How often do audiometric chambers need to be recalibrated? We got to do that at least annually. All right, some PrevMed for ground forces. Uh, what are some potential water sources? What are our potential water sources? All right, we can get water from existing public water, surface water, groundwater, salt water, and other. Uh, which one of these is usually your safest? Which one of these is usually your safest? Usually your existing public water, because usually your public water has at least been treated in some capacity. Um, what is the most common field purification system used in our system in use? What is the most common field purification system in use? That one is your ROPU, your, your, your reverse osmosis water purifying unit. Your ROPU is the most common. What is the most common method of disinfecting water? What is the most common method of disinfecting water? Well, that's with chlorination. We're going to chlorinate our water. Uh, what is the preferred agent for chlorination? What is the preferred agent for chlorination? Well, that's your calcium hypochlorite, your HTH 65 to 70%. What's the other less convenient method? Well, that's your sodium hypochlorite or your bleach. When should you read your free available chlorine after just adding after adding new chlorine, right? So when should you read your free available chlorine after chlorinating? Well, you want to wait at least 30 minutes. 30 minutes after chlorinating, that's when you're going to read it. Uh, what level of free available chlorine must be reached to superchlorinate a water container, right? Remember, we superchlorinate to disinfect it. All right, so what level do we got to reach? We got to get it to 100 parts per million. 100 parts per million. What level must it maintain? And for how long? We've got to keep it at at least 50. It cannot drop below 50, and we've got to keep it there for at least four hours. What else needs to be done to the water container while we are super chlorinating? What do we got to do to that water bowl over there? We got to we got to put the words poison do not drink clearly on every side and that in any water outlets or any spigots. What color should iodine tablets be? What color should iodine tablets be? Iodine tablets need to be steel gray. How many iodine tablets used to disinfect a canteen? How many iodine tablets to disinfect a canteen? Two. Uh, what if it's a two quart canteen? Well, then we're gonna use four. And then how many iodine tablets for a five gallon container? How many iodine tablets for a five gallon container? 40, 40 iodine tablets for a five gallon container. Um, what is the procedure for purifying water with iodine? How do we go about using iodine? Well, first we add the iodine tablet to the canteen. We place the cap on the canteen loosely. We wait five minutes. After five minutes, we're going to shake the canteens to allow leakage around the threads around the neck of the uh, canteen. And then we're going to tighten the cap and we're going to wait 30 minutes before using the water. For how long do you got to bring water to a rolling boil if you're using boiling to, to disinfect your water? How long do you have to boil it for? It's got to get to a rolling boil for at least two minutes. How often must water containers be disinfected? How often do we disinfect water containers? Whenever necessary, but not less than monthly, right? Not less than monthly, we got to disinfect water containers. How often is chlorine tested? How often is free available chlorine tested? We do that daily. We do that daily. Um, how often is water tested for bacteria? How often is water tested for bacteria? We do that weekly. 
um, what happens if a distribution system tests positive for bacteria? What are our retesting, are our retesting requirements? Well, we got to retest, we you know, where we got the positive bacteria after we you know, troubleshooted, we disinfected it. And then we also have to retest five with uh, uh, five uh, outlets with, uh, with an up, upstream and then five outlets downstream. How often are temperature readings on field refrigerators and freezers recorded? How often are temperature readings on field uh, refrigerators and freezers recorded? We got to do that with each meal, meal period and at least or at least three times per day. All right, with each meal period or at least three times per day. Uh, when must field reefers or uh, freezers be defrosted? When must field refrigerators or reefers be defrosted? When we have a frost accumulation on the coils that exceeds a fourth of an inch. A frost accumulation that ex exceeds a fourth of an inch. What temperature must field reefers be held at? What temperature must field refrigerators be at? They got to be at 40 degrees or below. 40 degrees or below on our field reefers. If thawing at room temperature, if we're thawing food at room temperature, what is the max temperature the room can be. What is the max temperature when thawing at room temperature? 80 degrees, 80 degrees. If buying produce from the local economy, what levels of chlorine, what levels of free available chlorine must it be soaked in? We can soak our produce in 100 parts per million of chlorine for 15 minutes or 50 parts of chlorine, right? 50 parts per million for 30 minutes, 100 parts per million for 15 minutes or 50 parts per million for 30 minutes. What is the shelf life of an MRE? What is the shelf life of an MRE? A sh uh, MRE is good for 48 months. What are the four types of waste? What are the four types of waste? Our four types of waste are gonna include human, liquid, garbage, and rubbish. Human, liquid, garbage, and rubbish are our four types of waste. Uh, what is used for human waste when troops are on the move? What is used for human waste when troops are on the move? That is our cat hole. Uh, what are the dimensions of a cat hole? What are the dimensions of a cat hole? A cat hole is going to be 8 to 12 inches wide by 6 to 12 inches deep. 8 to 12 inches wide by 6 to 12 inches deep on our cat hole. What is used for human waste in temporary bivouacs? What is used for human waste in temporary bivouacs? Well, that's going to be your saddle trench. How many people can a saddle trench serve? How many people can a saddle trench serve? 25 people. 25 people for a saddle trench. What are the dimensions of a saddle trench? A saddle trench is going to be 4 feet by 1 foot and then 2.5 feet deep. 4 by 1, right, and then 2.5 deep. Um, how far apart will additional saddle trenches be? If we're going to dig more than one, how far apart do they need to be? They got to be two feet apart, two feet apart for your saddle trenches. When closing a saddle trench, how high should the mound of dirt covering it be? When closing a saddle trench, how high should the mound of dirt covering it be? It's got to be at least one foot. What can be used where soil conditions are hard, rocky, frozen, and water tables are high when it comes to our human waste? What can we use um, if, we're, if essentially if we can't dig? Well, we can use a burn barrel latrine. Burn barrel latrine when, when soil conditions are hard, rocky, frozen, or the water table is too high. How much diesel fuel will be used to prime the barrel before use, right? So how much fuel is going to be put in the barrel before it goes into service? At least three inches. We want at least three inches of fuel in that barrel. Uh, what's what mixture is used when burning human waste in a burn barrel, right? What's the mixture of fuel going to be? We're going to use four parts diesel to one part gasoline. Four parts diesel to one uh, to one part gasoline. How deep should the ashes be buried? After we've burnt up all the waste, how deep do we bury it? We bury it at least 12 inches. What type of temporary latrine requires specialized drilling equipment? What type of temporary latrine requires specialized drilling equipment? That's your board hole latrine. Board hole latrine. What type of temporary latrine is most effectively used in sandy soils? What are we going to use in sandy soils? We're going to use a urine soakage pit. Urine soakage pit. What are the dimensions of the urine soakage pit? The urine soakage pit is four feet squared by four feet deep. Four by four by four. How many urine tubes are in the standard urine soakage pit? How many tubes in the standard urine soakage pit? Six. Six tubes. What are the dimensions of the tubes used? What are the dimensions of the tubes used? The tubes are going to be one inch by 36 inch pipe. One inch by 36 inch pipe. 
how much of the tube should be in the ground how much of the tube should be buried we say eight inches should be buried and then the remaining tube should come about 26 inches above the ground how many men will a pipe accommodate how many men will a pipe accommodate one pipe will accommodate 20 men 20 men how many men are urine troughs designed to serve how many men are urine troughs designed to serve 100 100 for a urine trough one soakage pit will service a field mess serving how many people one soakage pit will service a field mess serving how many people 200 people uh, what is used when groundwater levels or rock formation prevents the use of a soakage pit well, if we can't use a normal soakage pit, we're going to use a soakage trench. And then real quick, your soakage pit, it's got the same dimensions as your urine soakage pit, that 4 by 4 by 4 All right, but if we can't dig four feet deep, we're going to use a soakage trench. What are the dimensions of a soakage trench? Well, the soakage trench is going to have a central pit that's two feet squared by one foot deep because we can't dig that deep in the soil. And then it's going to have trenches, right, that are six feet long by one foot wide. And then right near the pit, right 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 near here it's only going to be one foot deep and then hopefully as we get further out it'll get down to about a one and a half feet deep all right how far do latrines need to be from any natural water source how far is a latrine location got to be from natural water well it's got to be at least 100 feet how far should latrines be from uh, sleeping or bivouac areas well we want to keep uh, latrines at least 50 feet away from any birthing and then how far should they be from any food service areas 100 yards 100 yards from the food service areas what are some physiological factors that might predispose someone to a heat injury some physiological factors that might predispose someone to a heat injury includes things like illness like a previous illness uh, previous history of heat injury dehydration fatigue obesity poor physical conditioning alcohol or drugs uh, and then sickle cell treat the trait these are all things that can make somebody more prone to getting a heat injury what heat injury occurs when there's excessive pulling of the blood into the extremities and consequently the brain does not receive enough blood well that's going to give you a case of heat syncope heat syncope how many weeks are optimal for acclimatization how many weeks are optimal for acclimatization three weeks three weeks to acclimatize uh, how much water per day should someone consume that is doing light work when the WBGT index is above 80 degrees light work WBGT above 80 degrees we want 8 to 10 quarts of water uh, how much water if we're doing heavy work in the WBGT index is above 80 if we're doing heavy work we're looking at 13 to 19 quarts a day um, what's the optimum temperature for drinking water optimum temperature for drinking water that's 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit what is the most effective means of assessing the effects of heat stress on the human body the most effective means of assessing heat stress on the human body well that's getting your WBGT index um, what WBGT index readings correlate with the following flag condition so what's a white flag what's a white flag condition well that's less than 80 right below than 80 uh, lower than 80 on the WBGT index we're going to call that white flag green flag what's green flag well green flag is going to be 80 to 84.9 80 to 84.9 yellow flag yellow flag will be 85 to 87.9 and then red flag red flag will be 88 to 89.9 because once we hit 90 90 and above that's a black flag how many points are added to the WBGT index when we're wearing body armor or NBC protective uniforms how much is going to be added to the WBGT index if we're wearing body armor or NBC protective uniforms we're going to add 10 points we're going to add 10 points to that WBGT index all right let's talk some water supply afloat uh, how many gallons per day per man is specified for new ship design by nav C how many gallons per day 50 gallons um, what color must potable water sounding ca tube caps be what color must potable water sounding tube caps be they got to be dark blue um, water heaters serving habitability spaces and showers like or in laboratories uh, cannot be set to exceed what temperature right so water heaters can't be above 120 degrees 
Uh, how are potable water hoses labeled? How are your potable water hoses labeled? Well, they're going to be labeled potable water only uh, in one inch white letters, and that's going to be every 10 feet. Every 10 feet, it's going to say potable water only, white letters that are one inch. All right, our HDH bottles. We got ready use stock and storeroom stock. Uh, when it comes to ready use stock, how many days supply can be maintained? How many days supply of ready use stock can be maintained? No more than seven days worth. How is ready use, stores, uh, ready use stock going to be stored? How is ready use stock of our HTH bottles going to be stored? It's going to be locked boxes that are mounted to the bulkhead that have ventilation holes drilled into the bottom that are at least a fourth of an inch. Your storeroom stock. Um, your storeroom stock uh, should be stored in a room that it does not exceed what temperature? Right? We can't put the uh, storeroom stock in a room that exceeds 100 degrees. Um, our storeroom stock can't be within, uh, it's got to be at least how many feet away from any source or surface that exceeds 140 degrees. How many feet away does it got to be uh, from any surface that gets 140 degrees? It's got to be at least five feet away. Uh, how must lockers and bins containing HTH be labeled? How must lockers and bins containing HTH be labeled? They've got to be labeled red letters on a white background, and it's got to say hazardous material, calcium hypochloride. Right, red letters on a white background, hazardous material, calcium hypochloride. What is the shelf life of a bromine cartridge? What is the shelf life of a bromine cartridge? Bromine cartridge is good for two years. How are potable water hoses disinfected? How are potable water hoses disinfected? They're going to be disinfected with 100 parts per million of free available chlorine. They got to have a two minute contact time with that 100 parts per million. And then after that, they'll be flushed with potable water. What level of free available chlorine should be reached in shipboard water with questionable taste or odor that cannot be identified? What level of free available chlorine should be reached in shipboard water with questionable taste and odor that cannot be identified? Well, we got to get it to five points or five parts per million in the tank, and then we want to maintain two parts per million throughout the distribution system. So you're going to be tasting that chlorine. Um, bacteriological testing must be done on what percentage of ice machines? We got to test what percentage of ice machines for uh, for bacteria. We say 25 percent or a fourth of them weekly, all right? 25% weekly. For how long must the medical department representative maintain a chronological record of potable water surveillance? For how long must the medical department representative maintain a chronological record of potable water surveillance? Well, they've got to maintain that record for two years, two years on that record. Okay, this uh, concludes this review session. Like I said, it was focused mostly on PrevMed. Uh, I'm going to put out other review sessions on the uh, on some of the other topics in a few days here. Um, as always, I hope this helps. Quick shout out to my after hours uh, study group, HM2 Earl, Gonzo, Harris, Bartholomew, Thompson, Malter, and then of course you, Frazier. Uh, you guys keep studying, right? I hope this helps.